Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me for another of my amazing interviews. Well, I have to say the channel's been going very well. We've had some fantastic guests and every now and again somebody pops up who I realise I ought to know more about their background than I really do. Uh, that's because I'm not actually very good at sports or uh, following sports. And then the opportunity to talk to somebody who's in the public eye that you'll know far better than me um, has occurred. I'd like to bring uh, onto the uh, platform today the wonderful Matt Letizier. Matt, you are internationally known. Uh, your background, of course, is in football. But from my point of view, what I find really fascinating is you're a household name that is prepared, like people like Neil Oliver, to stand up and actually talk about the stuff that's going on, the weird things that are happening to all of us that a lot of mainstream media, in fact, all of it, apart from, say, GB News, are prepared to address. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Richard. Good to talk to you. It's good to talk to you. Now, um, can I let, let me just start by asking, at what point did you start to realise things going on in the world were not quite what they should be? Um, I think it was um, fairly early on in, in 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm talking before any lockdown occurred, really. Uh, mm. uh, I think the first thing that, that kind of uh, was a red flag for me with the with the videos coming out of China of these people just dropping down in the street um, very unnaturally. Uh, and I thought that, that all looks a bit weird to me. Um, and then I spoke to a couple of doctors who are friends of mine I was out having dinner with them kind of late February, early March. Um, they'd seen the data uh, on what was coming out. And um, and they assured me at that early stage that um, the only people really who were going to be in any serious danger uh, were going to be incredibly old people or people with comorbidities. And, uh, and that this wasn't really going to affect too much uh, any young, healthy people. Um, and so they weren't at that stage, they, they weren't sure what all the fuss was about. And, uh, so I was kind of quite reassured by that. Um, and I think because of that conversation, um, I then didn't buy into the, uh, into the fear mongering propaganda that the mainstream news channels were, were then starting to churn out when it came to, you know, lock, locking down people. And, um, and so, yeah, I kind of, I kind of been able to was able to detach myself from the propaganda and, and just look at things rationally and logically and, and come to my own conclusions. And, I mean, it was fascinating, wasn't it, where one day Chris Whitty stood up and said exactly as you said, you know, not not much to worry about. But the next day it was as if the script had just been rewritten and changed. And suddenly we started this nonsense drama that was thrust up upon us. How did you, your fellow, your family, your fellow colleagues um, and people that you would associate with, what, what did they think as things were unfolding? Um, I think as, as the propaganda ramped up and, you know, we had the, the daily death tolls and uh, all that stuff, um, uh, I think a lot of them were taken in by uh, the, uh, the fear mongering um, and a lot of them, uh, probably thought that I was going a little bit mad back in 2020 because I, I was constantly um, speaking out against uh, what was being thrown at us 24 hours a day through uh, through the media, um, and I think they were they were quite concerned for <laughs> for me, um, and I think as time has gone on, uh, a lot of them have realised that actually, you know, the stuff that I was saying back in 2020 was actually um, pretty much bang on, and that, uh, and that they, they now don't think I'm mad, and they actually think that, um, you know, I, I, I had a lot of valid points back then. And I mean, somebody who's in the in the public eye and being interviewed a lot, did you get opportunities to question the journalists if they if they were doing a feature about you or about anything to find out? No, no, there was the, the, there was uh, nothing. The, the journalistic integrity. Uh, has been thrown out the window. Um, you know, normally, if they were doing a story about you, they would contact you for uh, for some kind of quote um, to you know be able to counter what they were writing against you. Um, but that went out the window, and it was just attack after attack in the mainstream media. Um, and uh, but that's something that 
is kind of water off a duck's back to me. I, I spent 17 years as a professional footballer being criticised in the media, uh, so it didn't really have a great deal of effect. I think they were hoping that um, by by attacking me in that way that they thought they could shut me up. Um, yes. But unfortunately, and- they don't really know my character very well. <laughs> <laughs> so it had the opposite effect, I imagine. It, it did have the opposite effect. You know, I'm, I'm incredibly stubborn, and if I, if I feel I'm right about something, um, I'll stick to my guns until I'm until I'm a hundred percent proved wrong. In which point, I would be big enough as a man to go, "Oh, sorry, I, I got that one wrong. I apologise." Mm. Uh, so far, uh, I mean, there's been a couple of things that I've tweeted where uh, I, it was probably um, a, a misjudgment on my part in terms of the the content that I used. Uh, at which point, I do. I, I, I held my hand up and I apologised and I, I deleted the, uh, the the said tweets. Uh, when I thought that it was, I'd gone a, a little bit too far, um, and I think that's what we should do in a in a reasonable society. You know, we should be able to have this freedom of speech, and um, and if people make mistakes, then you should be big enough to own up to them, hold your hands up, and and move on. You know, and yes. unfortunately, there's only there's only one side of the debate over the last three years that have been able to do that, and it's not the mainstream media side. No, absolutely. So when when the uh, the vaccines were being initially propose that don't panic you don't have to to worry don't worry about using anything else like ivermectin or any of the other potential th- even vitamin d for goodness sake you know what what did you think that that this experimental drug that was coming at warp speed um was did you see it as a panacea at all um or were you quite skeptical uh, I, I was incredibly skeptical um I I'd kind of start. I'd listen to a, a few people who um, had some, you know, at the time were were pretty out there ideas about what was going on and um, uh, and how they were going to, you know, try to get a, a, an injection to everybody's arm in the in the world. You know, try to inject every human being on the planet. I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. Uh, it's you know, it's pretty common knowledge how long it takes to develop a vaccine. Yeah, you know. And they're saying that they've got this, yeah, they've never had a vaccine for a coronavirus before, but all of a sudden in the space of a year, four companies have uh, have come up with a, a new vaccine. And in the space of a year, there's no way it's physically impossible to know what any medium term or long term side effects are, are going to be of these vaccines. And given the fact that the, you know, for, for my demographic of, of people, the risk was incredibly low of um, of dying from um, this uh, <laughs> this virus. That it was just a no brainer for me to just go. No, there's not a chance that I'm taking that. I'm using my my common sense. I'm I'm taking in all the available knowledge that's gone on, all the statistics that are out there, and and I'm going. Well, no, I think uh, I'll take my chances with this one. I don't I don't think yes. I need. Yeah, no, and um, and then I mean, it just seemed to get lower, and the age was lowered and lowered and lowered on such a ridiculous scale, particularly as it started to head to kids in their twenties, college ch- kids, and university students, and then pregnant mothers. Oh, honestly, it's just disgusting what they what they did. I mean, Matt Hancock stood up in Parliament. I think even before, even before the vaccine had rolled out. And had said in Parliament, this is an adult-only vaccine. And I remember, I, I was, I remember, I was watching it. I sat there watching it, and I actually, stupidly, <laughs> when I was watching it, I, it actually brought me a sense of relief that they weren't going to put this stuff into children. Yes. Uh, then, obviously, a few months later, yeah, here we go, here it comes, and it is the boiling the ethical frog. Uh, stuff you know they'll, they'll they'll do it very gradually they'll take it down the ages and everyone go oh well you know it's only this it's only this and eventually you know they, they went for the, the the youngsters they went for the babies they went for the pregnant mothers I mean gee whiz a pregnant mother they tell them not to eat even eat any soft cheese and yet yeah. they are going yeah you're all right put this toxic stuff in your body it, it won't it won't harm you at all wow I mean there was just there have been crimes against humanity committed all over the place. What do you think um, this says about the general public who were buying into all of this, that they weren't using any form of critical thinking to make the same sort of decisions? I mean, it does 
it seems to me that it, it's made me very aware of how easily manipulated we are and and that we've put so much trust in authority yeah. figures rather than actually being able to disseminate things for ourselves. Yeah, and that's uh, uh, that, I think, has been a, a long-term plan. Uh, I think the, the schooling, the education that we get teaches us that, you know. Um, uh, I, I think you've got parents that send their children off to school and say, you know, you must obey the authority, you must listen to your teachers, you know, whereas really what we should be saying was, uh, you know, I mean, you don't know, you don't know those teachers that you're telling your child, go and you listen to that teacher. You do as the teacher tells you. What if that teacher is a paedophile? Mm. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? You have to give your children some kind of sense of, do you know what, just, you know, go careful, use your intuition. If something that your teacher is saying doesn't feel quite right, feel free to question it. That's what I've taught my daughter. Um, you know, I've always said to her, you know, if there's something you don't think's right, you ask questions about your teachers. You don't just, you don't just give them this uh, air of invincibility, this air that they know everything and you've got to do everything that they tell you. Because I think that's a really dangerous place to be. Because you wouldn't send your, you wouldn't send your kid across the road or to a house that you didn't know the person inside and say, oh, spend eight or six hours in the company of this un- person I don't know. I've just seen them walk down the street. Go and cross there and and sit with them. You'd you do you do due d- d- diligence and, yeah. and try and work out who they are and 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 yet we do that with the with the schools and of course then the schools will get other teachers in or the teacher will leave and you don't know who they are. And, yeah. they come, and it does seem that schools are very reluctant also to share what goes on behind those doors. It certainly does, yes. I mean, this uh, PHSE lesson that they're doing, some of the stuff that my daughter has come back and told me that they've been talking to them about uh, is completely age inappropriate. Um, and it's almost, it, it is grooming. It, it, mm. it, it feels to me like it's it's uh, grooming our children. And and as I said said before, the the boiling the ethical frog thing, they're trying to um, sexualize our children at a much younger age than they they ever really should be. And um, it appears to me that the next step along all of this this, uh, journey that we're on is that they will try and normalize paedophilia. Mm. And and we we know, I mean, from that film, The Cry of Freedom, how large the the whole child trafficking is um and and of course a, a number of people will have already known that or had suspicions of that and it probably goes a lot further than the film is actually able to um show but yeah. the, but we the worry that our children are being targeted and yet it still seems that parents on the whole are quite happy to dress their children up or buy children inappropriate clothing, uh, which is being marketed to them through advertising, send them to schools that are, as you've just described, are teaching inappropriate, age inappropriate stuff. Uh, where do we go from here? How do we pull that back from from the from the from the for the children of the future? Yeah, uh, I mean that's the that's the million dollar question at the moment. Yes. And I think there are a lot of good groups out there that are uh, are trying to fight back through the legal uh, processes. And there have been some uh, victories along the way, but it's it's going to be a long battle. You know, you have to fight at at a local level. You know, you have to get involved if you're uh, you're worried about what your kids are being taught at schools. You've got to uh, get involved with um, speaking to your schools, you know, asking them for the details of the lessons. What are they teaching your child? If you're concerned about it, you've got to show that concern. You can't just be uh, mm. about it all and just sit back and just let it happen. Um, you know, and, and I think that's where you that's where you make a change is if you start from the bottom up um, and and try to build uh, a community uh, right from the grassroots, and then eventually, you know, kind of take it step by step in an upward direction. I think what you said uh, just a few moments ago about um, t- teaching your daughter to question. I mean, I've seen a few TikTok videos. I'm not a great TikTok user myself, but people have sent them to me of children in the class, young teenagers or, you know, 15-year-olds 
who are questioning their teacher when they're talking about how many genders or what we, you know, the whole sort of woke side of things with, with the gender ideology. And they're saying, no, 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 I think actually, you know, there's our opinion is this, there's two genders, as the one I've heard. And then the, the, the teacher's unex, un, uh, unable to accept that, that. No, no, the doctrine is that you have to accept that there are multiple genders. Now, if people want to believe that that's fine but i don't think teachers should be ramming that down young people exactly. let them let them come to their own conclusions and have their own opinions exactly right uh, that, that is the whole point of uh, freedom of speech you know there's the it's the the frustrating thing about everything is that there are two sides uh, on this debate but only one side is tolerant of the other side's views yes um and that for for me is the most telling thing uh, about all of this you know you there there is no one authority on any given subject on the planet there is nobody who is the arbiter of truth on every given subject you have opinions um and 99 percent of the time that's all it is it's an opinion and people should be allowed to express their opinions freely they shouldn't be battered into submission to believe something that they don't believe to be true Yes, and and an opinion. Science is the same with a hypothesis until it's proved otherwise, and of course we've been following the science all the way through the pandemic. And if we I'm just, m m yeah, if we we just move back to so the the point where this vaccine came in, as we were earlier discussing, and then we had people like Andrew Bridgen standing up in the House of Commons alerting the government which is what any MP ought to do, and saying, actually, in my consistency, uh, consistency there's, been pe there's been harms, I'm a bit worried about this, pointing out the yellow card system of almost, at, I think it was the 13th of December when he stood up, and there was nearly 500,000 registered problems, and of course there'd be many more that were just not registered, and yet the government were quite happy to completely ignore that, and in fact make him seem to be a conspiracy theorist yeah. uh, when clearly people were having problems. Now, I know that you've been involved in this and you've seen uh, people have uh, issues with the, the vaccine. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've interviewed um, quite a few of the, the people that have uh, had vaccine injuries um, and they've they've just been treated appallingly by, by this government. They've been uh, ignored. They've been accused of you know, making it up. Um, uh, and it's just been so disgusting the way that these people have been treated because at the end of the day, they did what their government asked them to. Yeah. That, the government asked them to get vaccinated to, you know, save granny, uh, all that nonsense, which has now been proved that um, it is a complete lie because the vaccines weren't tested uh, for whether or not you could pass it on uh, if you if you actually caught so. It's it's just been horrific the way that the vaccine injured have been treated and ignored. Um, you know, I, I, it really frustrates me that there are um, members of parliament that are that know all about this. They can't, they cannot not know anymore. There's been too much of it around. They can't yes. claim ignorance. They know all about it, and they are actively turning a blind eye to it. And that, for me is a it is just reprehensible it's a it's a crime against humanity in my opinion and and they must i mean i think they just look so isolated now uh, i mean they look so stupid that, uh, along with mainstream media um in the way that they're they're just doubling down no nothing to see here no problem whatsoever safe and effective all these sort of mealy mouth phrases and yet look anywhere else and the truth is there uh, uh, how they can continue to continually keep on that line is is beyond me. Uh, and I suppose the problem is they just don't want to face the reality that they've either cocked up or it was something more sinister, which um, yeah. I think a lot of us uh, are beginning to come to that conclusion. Yeah, um, I, I think there was definitely something a, a lot more sinister than that and um and i think you're right i think it's probably a combination of things uh, i think some people would have uh would be feeling guilty i think there would be a, a hell of a lot of guilt 
uh, for people that were uh, suckered into thinking that these things were safe and effective. Uh, I mean, the government themselves, you, we spoke about the, the VAERS system, the yellow card reporting system. Um, the government acknowledged themselves that probably only between one and 10% of all those uh, reports actually get reported. So you could, you could either, you know, the number that you mentioned, you could times that by 10 or you could times that by 100. Yeah. Uh, and that's closer to the real number of people that have suffered because of this. And it, and it is absolutely awful, that, that, as you say, the way they're being treated and, and um, you know, they're having to resort to legal cases in order to bring that up, which causes huge <laughs> delay in in getting anything and it's not certain they'll get anywhere and even if they do I, I can't remember what the payment is but it's for the damage that's done to them from this thing it's a paltry sum the maximum they can get is 120,000 pounds and uh and that is if they can prove that they are more than 60 percent disabled now how do you go about proving yeah percent disabled it's yeah such, it's such a ridiculous way of doing that i mean who is who's judging that and and what criteria are they using to judge that it's it's just so open-ended that that system can be easily abused and i've come to the conclusion that there's a lot of things in place in our government that are deliberately worded so that they are easy to be abused mm. no i agree what does that make you feel now for the future um in terms of I mean, we've got a, uh, a um, an election coming up fairly soon. We have two parties that seem to be on the same page. You could probably put a fag paper between the two of them. One would probably lock us down even longer, even though Hancock himself has said, oh, we've made such a mistake. We should have locked down earlier. We should have locked down longer. And you just think, oh, my God, these, these people should not have hands on any form of power. Psychopath. Uh, a absolutely. But so what does it make you feel? How, where do you, what do you think the future holds for us? Um, uh, it certainly doesn't give me any great confidence in our uh, electoral systems. Um, it doesn't give me any great confidence that, that one of those two parties would be better than the other one. Uh, as you say, there's a, there's a fag paper between them. I, I actually come to the conclusion that um, it really doesn't matter whether it's blue or red. Um, mm. They are two cheeks of the same backside uh, and they're being controlled by the same people. Um, I, and I believe we only have an illusion of democracy. Uh, I don't believe we have a democracy at all. Um, so uh, I've kind of never been a, a, a politically minded person. I, I've never even voted in, a, in, a, in an election. I've always really had the gut feeling that politicians, uh, a lot of politicians don't appear to be in politics for the right reasons. Uh, I don't think they're there to serve the people. Um, uh, I think they're there to uh, serve their own self-interest, uh, quite frankly, quite a lot of them. And, um, uh, and I think it's quite a, a poor system that we have where, you know, we only get to... I would much prefer a system where we were governed on policies and not on parties. Well, yeah, that's... Uh, I like that idea. Um, I think it's very clear though to the public now i mean they must be waking up in great numbers to realize that actually these people are not serving us with all the nonsense that they're pushing down so rapidly the digital ids and these notions of putting us into 15 minute cities in which in order to sell us the idea of this wonderful heaven that everything will be within 15 minutes you need cameras and fines in order to keep you in there and oh by the way you won't be able to drive your car more than so many times. In fact, you know, we're going to get rid of cars in seven years anyway, whether you like it or not, whether you've voted for it or, or been part of the discussion. That they, how they think they're going to hold on to power. Do you think people are waking up in significant numbers now? Uh, I, I certainly think. Um, I, I would probably estimate, given, you know, the interactions that I have with people, I would say there's probably about 20% of people that are, that are awake to everything that's going on, um, and which doesn't sound a lot, but um, uh, I think it's significant enough that they will have great trouble implementing everything that they're trying to do. I think there's enough of us uh, to cause enough of a storm and to turn other people's 
uh, opinions because I also believe in, in you know there's twenty percent of us that are awake, but I think there's another sixty percent that are open uh, to having their minds changed about things. Um, uh, and so I think there is still a, a huge amount of uh, fights ahead for us. Um, but I think the numbers are growing day by day. Uh, and I think eventually uh, we will have uh, enough and be disruptive enough to, to stop their ultimate plans from, you know, what is looking like um, a one world government. Yes, ab- no, absolutely. So let me finish off by asking you what you think the future holds for us, good and bad. Yeah, well, uh, well, as I said, I, I think there's a, a lot of battles ahead. The, the war uh, hasn't been won. Uh, we've won a few battles, um, and th- there's plenty more to come. But I, I really still hold the belief, and I'm very positive in this, that uh, I believe that on this planet there is way more good people uh, on this planet than there is evil. Uh, and I think what we are seeing at the moment is a is a battle, a spiritual battle of good versus evil. Uh, and when you have the numbers on your side in a, in a battle like that, um, you will eventually win. Uh, you know, the other side might have a few uh, battles that they win, but eventually the numbers will win the war. Uh, well, I'm I'm very much on your side. I mean, I do believe in humanity. Mm. Um, and I think that as people start to have so many of these things pushed at them, it, it only needs one of those things to start a debate, whether it be the children at school coming home saying we've been talking about masturbation mum and dad and <laughs> seeing the parents go what what um uh, what Th- excuse me i didn't expect that word to come from your mouth little eight-year-old child in front yeah. of me um or, or whether it be the digital ids or 15 minute cities it, it, there's so many of these things uh, that are being thrust at, at us that i think you, you're absolutely right one of those debates then starts to sort of get a further debate and people can start widening it up and then starting to see. And I think once the veil has been lifted and you see the man behind the curtain working the mechanics and you realise actually they're all puppets yep. and um, their time has come, then yep. I'm very hopeful that there's going to be a, a better future. But as you say, they may throw a few more things down at us. And, but the thing is, I do think they'll become more and more obvious and more and more ridiculous as the as as we've seen with i mean the weather at the moment they're telling us that we're in heat waves and it's never been hotter no. and you think this is i mean it's madness do they really think we're that gullible and stupid i mean it's just absolutely incredible that the bbc are going with these narratives when when we're probably having one of the coldest julys i think i've ever experienced <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. They're, they're just going, don't look at the weather in this country. Look over here where it's really hot. Well, well funny enough, it's really hot every summer in southern Europe. It's strange that. And I, is it, it was a couple of years ago, I, or it may have been last year, these years are sort of going so quickly now, um, that we, somebody, we had that 42 degree day somewhere in London or whatever. And they were saying, oh, no, the planet is 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 burning up. And you think. But it's 42 degrees in, and more probably in the Sahara or in other hot countries. Yeah, it's not, it's things don't ignite, you know, just at 42 degrees. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just incredible how they, how they weaponize these things. to, And it's just it just goes along with the It's the same story as the, the COVID fear mongering. It's now the climate fear mongering. And that's what we'll be getting. But if you just, you know, turn your turn your televisions off is the best bit of advice I can give to people when it comes to uh, when it comes to the news. Go and have a look at independent uh, news journalists who are actually putting out proper stories and uh, without uh, any propaganda and, and letting people see t- both sides of the story. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, I've got rid of my television a few years ago, and I no longer pay the BBC to uh, spout out all their nonsense. No, um, no. Where, where can we find, uh, are you doing anything particularly uh, that people should uh, know about and get involved in? Have you got any projects and things that you'd like to uh, have um, a moment to? Well, I'm just on, uh, I'm on, um, they can find me on social media on uh, on Twitter and Getter, uh, at MattLatis7. Uh, and I've also got my, uh, my new website, uh, mlt7.com, um, which... Uh, they can sign up to my free newsletter, um, which I put out once a week uh, to let you know what's going on in my world. 
Fantastic. Is that MLT7 seven, as in the letter 7? Number 7, yeah. Number 7.com. I'll put a link in the description so people can quickly find it. Perfect. And, uh, yeah, that sounds really good. Matt, thank you so much for, for talking to me. I think it's just so reassuring um, for people. I mean, they watch lots of unknown people on YouTube who are sort of breaking out and doing their stuff. But it's great to have familiar faces who you know it's just that psychological thing that that listening to people who've been around they've known them and they're talking sense um is so reassuring for people so i really appreciate you coming on and and, and giving us your time my pleasure richard good to talk to you and uh, i'll see you again in a few weeks won't i we will yeah i'm very much looking forward to it yeah we have um we have a show down in southampton if you happen to be there actually i've forgotten the the date of it now but it's at the attic in southampton and we're we're going to be having a, a further conversation. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, talking more than we can on platforms like YouTube. I think it was so. 21st of October, I think. 21st of October. There we are. You, you've got your diary in your head. Mine's <laughs> on a bit of... I keep my diary on paper now. I can't bear to have it on the phone and where it can be hacked or anything like that. I'm going back to many more of the old analogue ways yeah. as much as I can. It seems a lot safer. Good idea. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Matt. Look forward to seeing you again. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed the show. Um, don't forget to come back and subscribe and all the usual, and I'll be back with uh, more wonderful interviews. But from Matt and I, thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>